the autotelic personality. Other things being equal, a life filled with complex flow activities is more worth living than one spent consuming passive entertainment. In the words of a woman describing what her career means to her, to be totally absorbed in what you are doing and to enjoy it so much that you don't want to be doing anything else, I don't see how people survive if they don't experience something like that. Or as the historian C. Van Woodward says of his work, which involves trying to understand the dynamics of the American South, it interests me and is a source of satisfaction, achieving something that one thinks is important. Without such a consciousness or motivation, it seems to me that life could be rather dull and purposeless, and I wouldn't want to attempt that kind of life. Of complete leisure, say, of having absolutely nothing to do that one felt was worth doing? That strikes me as a rather desperate situation to be in. When we are able to confront life with such involvement and enthusiasm, we can be said to have achieved an autotelic personality. Autotelic is a word composed of two Greek roots, auto, meaning self, and telos, meaning goal. An autotelic activity is one we do for its own sake because to experience it is the main goal. For instance, if I played a game of chess primarily to enjoy the game, that game would be an autotelic experience for me. Whereas if I played for money or to achieve a competitive ranking in the chess world, the same game would be primarily exotelic, that is, motivated by an outside goal. Applied to personality, autotelic denotes an individual who generally does things for their own sake, rather than in order to achieve some later external goal. Of course, no one is fully autotelic, because we all have to do things even if we don't enjoy them, either out of a sense of duty or necessity. But there is a gradation, ranging from individuals who almost never feel that what they do is worth doing for its own sake, to others who feel that most anything they do is important and valuable in its own right. It is to these latter individuals that the term autotelic applies. An autotelic person needs few material possessions and little entertainment, comfort, power, or fame because so much of what he or she does is already rewarding. Because such persons experience a flow in work, in family life, when interacting with people, when eating, and even when alone with nothing to do, they are less dependent on the external rewards that keep others motivated to go on with a life composed of dull and meaningless routines. They are more autonomous and independent because they cannot be as easily manipulated with threats or rewards from the outside. At the same time, they are more involved with everything around them because they are fully immersed in the current of life. But how can one find out if someone is autotelic? The best method is to observe a person over a long period of time in many different situations. A short test of the kind psychologists use is not very appropriate, in part because flow is such a subjective experience that it would be relatively easy for a person to fake his or her responses. A prolonged interview or questionnaire may help, but I prefer to use a more indirect measure. According to the theory, persons should be in flow when they perceive both the challenges in a given situation and their skills to be high. So one way of measuring how autotelic a person is is by computing the frequency with which they report being in a high-challenge, high-skill situation over a week of paging with the experience sampling method. We find that there are people who report being in this situation over 70% of the time, and others less than 10%. We assume that the former are more autotelic than the latter. Using this method, we can look at what distinguishes people whose experiences are mainly autotelic from those who rarely experience this state. For instance, in one study, we took a group of 200 very talented teenagers and divided them into two groups, 50 whose frequency of high challenges, high skill responses during the week was in the upper quartile, the autotelic group, and contrasted them with 50 who were in the lower quartile, the non-autotelic group. Then we asked the question, are these two groups of adolescents using their time in different ways? Each autotelic teenager spent on average 11% of waking time studying, which is 5 percentage points more than a teen in the other group spent. Because each percentage point is roughly equivalent to one hour, we can say that in a week, the autotelic teens spent 11 hours studying, the others, six. The other differences involve hobbies, where the first group spent almost twice the amount of time, six versus 3.5%, and sports, 2.5 versus 1%. The one reversal is in terms of time spent watching television. The non-autotelic watched TV almost twice as often as the autotelic, 15.2 versus 8.5. Very similar and equally significant results were found in a later study of a representative sample of American adolescents, where 202 autotelic teenagers were compared to 202 non-autotelic ones. 
Clearly, an important dimension of what it means to be autotelic is what one does with one's time. Passive leisure and entertainment do not provide much opportunity to exercise one's skills. One learns to experience flow by getting involved in activities that are more suited to provide it, namely, mental work and active leisure. But is the quality of experience of autotelic youngsters better than that of their peers? After all, the fact that they do more challenging things is in part true by definition, since we defined being autotelic as being often in challenging situations. The real question is whether being often in flow-producing situations actually improves subjective experience. The answer is yes. In the study, the results showed that when involved in productive activities, the first group concentrates significantly more, has a significantly higher self-esteem, and sees what they are doing as very significantly more important for their future goals. However, the two groups are not significantly different in terms of enjoyment or happiness. How about the quality of experience in active leisure? First of all, as one would expect, in leisure, all teens report higher enjoyment and happiness than they do in productive activities. However, they concentrate less and feel that what they do is less important for their future goals. The comparisons between the groups, except for happiness, are all statistically significant. Autotelic youngsters concentrate more, enjoy themselves more, have higher self-esteem, and see what they do is more related to their future goals. All of this fits what we would expect, except for one thing. Why aren't they happier? What I have learned from decades of doing research with the ESM is that self-reported happiness is not a very good indicator of the quality of a person's life. Some people say they are happy even when they dislike their jobs, when their home life is non-existent, when they spend all their time in meaningless activities. We are resilient creatures, and apparently we are able to avoid feeling sad even when all the conditions suggest otherwise. If we can't say we are at least somewhat happy, what's the point of going on? Autotelic persons are not necessarily happier, but they are involved in more complex activities and they feel better about themselves as a result. It is not enough to be happy to have an excellent life. The point is to be happy while doing things that stretch our skills, that help us grow and fulfill our potential. This is especially true in the early years. A teenager who feels happy doing nothing is unlikely to grow into a happy adult. Another interesting finding is that the autotelic group spends a significantly higher amount of time interacting with the family on the order of four hours a week compared to the others. This explains why they learn to enjoy more whatever they are doing. The family seems to act as a protective environment where a child can experiment in relative security without having to be self-conscious and worry about being defensive or competitive. American child-rearing has emphasized early independence of a central goal. The sooner adolescents left their parents, emotionally as well as physically, the earlier they were supposed to mature. But early maturity is not such a great idea. Left to fend for themselves too early, young people can easily become insecure and defensive. It could be argued, in fact, that the more complex the adult world in which they have defined a place, the longer a period of dependence an adolescent needs in order to prepare for it. Of course, this social neoteny only works if the family is a relatively complex unit that provides stimulation as well as support. It would not help a child to stay dependent on a dysfunctional family. If there is one quality that distinguishes autotelic individuals, it is that their psychic energy seems inexhaustible. Even though they have no greater attentional capacity than anyone else, they pay more attention to what happens around them, they notice more, and they are willing to invest more attention in things for their own sake, without expecting an immediate return. Most of us hoard attention carefully. We dole it out only for serious things, for things that matter. We only get interested in whatever will promote our welfare. The objects most worthy of our psychic energy are ourselves and the people and things that will give us some material or emotional advantage. The result is that we don't have much attention left over to participate in the world on its own terms, to be surprised, to learn new things, to empathize, or to grow beyond the limits set by our self-centeredness. Autotelic persons are less concerned with themselves and therefore have more free psychic energy to experience life with. Kelly, one of the teenagers in our study, who usually reports high challenges and high skills on her ESM forms, differs from her classmates in that she is not thinking most of the time about boyfriends, shopping at the mall, or how to get good grades. Instead, she is fascinated by mythology and calls herself a Celtic scholar. She works in a museum three afternoons a week, helping to store and classify artifacts. She enjoys even the most routine aspects of her work, like putting everything in cubbyholes and things like that, she said, as well as being alert to what is going on around her and learning from it. 
At the same time, she enjoys her friends, with whom she has long debates about religion and life after school. This does not mean that she is altruistic or self-effacing. Her interests are still expressions of her unique individuality, but she seems to genuinely care for what she does, at least in part for its own sake. Creative individuals are usually autotelic as well, and they often achieve their breakthroughs because they have surplus psychic energy to invest in apparently trivial objects. The neuropsychologist, Brenda Milner, describes the attitude she has toward work, which is shared by other scientists or artists at the frontiers of their field. She said, I would say I am impartial about what is important or great, because every new little discovery, even a tiny one, is exciting at the moment of discovery. The historian Natalie Davis explains how she chooses the problems to work on. Well, I just get really curious about some problem. It just hooks in very deeply. At the time, it just seems terribly interesting. I may not know what is personally invested in it, other than my curiosity and my delight. The inventor Frank Offner, who, after perfecting jet engines and EEG machines, at age 81 became interested in studying the physiology of hair cells, gives a perfect example of the humility of autotelic individuals confronting the mysteries of life, even the seemingly most insignificant ones. Oh, I love to solve problems. If it is why our dishwasher doesn't work, or why the automobile does not work, or how the nerve works, or anything. Now I'm working with Peter on how the hair cells work, and, uh, it is so very interesting. I don't care what kind of problem it is. If I can solve it, it is fun. It's really a lot of fun to solve problems, isn't it? Isn't that what's interesting in life? This last quote also suggests that the interest of an autotelic person is not entirely passive or contemplative. It also involves an attempt to understand, or in the case of the inventor, to solve problems. The important point is that the interest be disinterested. In other words, that it is not entirely at the service of one's own agenda. Only if attention is to a certain extent free of personal goals and ambitions do we have a chance of apprehending reality in its own terms. Some people seem to have had this surplus attention available to them very early in life and used it to wonder about everything within their ken. The inventor Jacob Rabinow saw his first automobile when he was seven years old as he was growing up in a Chinese provincial town. He remembers immediately crawling under the car to see how the wheels were turned by the engine, and then going home to carve a transmission and differential gears out of wood. Linus Pauling describes his childhood in terms typical of most creative individuals. He said, When I was 11 years old, well, first, I liked to read, and I read many books. When I was just turning nine, I had already read the Bible and Darwin's Origin of Species. And when I was 12 and had a course in ancient history in high school, first year, I enjoyed reading this textbook so that, by the first few weeks of the year, I had read through the whole textbook and was looking around for other material about the ancient world. When I was 11, I began collecting insects and reading books in entomology. When I was 12, I made an effort to collect minerals. I found some agates. That was about all I could find and recognize in the Willamette Valley. But I read books on mineralogy and copied tables of properties, hardness and color and streak and other properties of the minerals out of the books. And then when I was 13, I became interested in chemistry. I was very excited when I realized that chemists could convert certain substances into other substances with quite different properties. Hydrogen and oxygen gases forming water, or sodium and chlorine forming sodium chloride. Quite different substances from the elements that combine to form the compounds. So ever since then, I have spent much of my time trying to better understand chemistry. And this means really to understand the world, the nature of the universe. It is important to notice that Pauling was not a child prodigy who astonished his elders with intellectual brilliance. He pursued his interests on his own, without recognition and little support. What started him on a long and productive life was a determination to participate as fully as possible in the life around him. Hazel Henderson, who has devoted her adult life to starting organizations for the protection of the environment, such as Citizens for Clean Air, describes vividly the attitude of joyous interest such people share. She said, when I was five, you know, like where you just open your eyes and look around and say, wow, what an incredible trip this is. What the hell is going on? What am I supposed to be doing here? I've had that question in me all my life, and I love it. It makes every day very fresh. And then every morning you wake up, and it's like the dawn of creation. But not everyone is fortunate to have as much free psychic energy as Pauling or Henderson. Most of us have learned to save up our attention to cope with the immediate demands of living and have little of it left over to be interested in the nature of the universe, our place in the cosmos, or in anything else that will not register as a gain on our ledger of immediate goals. Yet without disinterested interest, 
Life is uninteresting. There is no room in it for wonder, novelty, surprise, for transcending the limits imposed by our fears and prejudices. If one has failed to develop curiosity and interest in the early years, it is a good idea to acquire them now, before it is too late to improve the quality of life. To do so is fairly easy in principle, but more difficult in practice. Yet it's sure worth trying. And the first step is to develop the habit of doing whatever needs to be done with concentrated attention, with skill rather than inertia. Even the most routine tasks, like washing dishes, dressing, or mowing the lawn, become more rewarding if we approach them with the care it would take to make a work of art. The next step is to transfer some psychic energy each day from tasks that we don't like doing, or from passive leisure, into something we never did before, or something we enjoy doing but don't do often enough because it seems too much trouble. There are literally millions of potentially interesting things in the world to see, to do, and to learn about. But they don't become actually interesting until we devote attention to them. Many people will say that this advice is useless to them because they already have so many demands on their time that they absolutely cannot afford to do anything new or interesting. Time stress has become one of the most popular complaints of the day. But more often than not, it is an excuse for not taking control of our lives. How many of the things that we do are really necessary? How many of the demands could be reduced if we put some energy into prioritizing, organizing, and streamlining the routines that now fritter away our attention? It is true that if we let time run through our fingers, we will soon have none left. One must learn to husband it carefully, not so much in order to achieve wealth and security in some distant future, but in order to enjoy life in the here and now. Time is what one must find in order to develop interest and curiosity to enjoy life for its own sake. The other equally important resource is the ability to control psychic energy. Instead of waiting for an external stimulus or challenge to grab our attention, we must learn to concentrate it more or less at will. This ability is related to interest by a feedback loop of mutual causation and reinforcement. If you are interested in something, you will focus on it, and if you focus attention on anything, it is likely that you will become interested in it. Many of the things we find interesting are not so by nature, but because we took the trouble of paying attention to them. Until one starts to collect them, insects and minerals are not very appealing, nor are most people until we find out about their lives and thoughts. Running marathons or climbing mountains, the game of bridge or Racine's dramas are rather boring except to those who have invested enough attention to realize their intricate complexity. As one focuses on any segment of reality, a potentially infinite range of opportunities for action, physical, mental, or emotional, is revealed for our skills to engage with. There is never a good excuse for being bored. To control attention means to control experience and therefore the quality of life. Information reaches consciousness only when we attend to it. Attention acts as a filter between outside events and our experience of them. How much stress we experience depends more on how well we control attention than on what happens to us. The effect of physical pain, of a monetary loss, of a social snub, depends on how much attention we pay to it, how much room we allow for it in consciousness. The more psychic energy we invest in a painful event, the more real it becomes and the more entropy it introduces in consciousness. To deny, repress, or misinterpret such events is no solution either, because the information will keep smoldering in the recesses of the mind, draining away psychic energy to keep it from spreading. It is better to look suffering straight in the eye, acknowledge and respect its presence, and then get busy as soon as possible focusing on things we choose to focus on. In a study of people who became severely handicapped by disease or by accidents, blind or paraplegic, Professor Fausto Massimini and his team found that several had adapted remarkably to their tragedy and claimed that their lives had become better as a result of their handicap. What distinguished such individuals is that they decided to master their limitation through an unprecedented discipline of their psychic energy. They learned to derive flow from the simplest skills like dressing, walking around the house, and driving a car. Those who did best went far beyond just negotiating again the basic tasks of life. One became a swimming instructor, others became accountants, traveled to play at international chess tournaments and swimming meets, or became archery champions, shooting from a wheelchair. 
The same ability to transform a tragic situation into at least a tolerable one is shown by victims of terrorists who survive solitary confinement or prisons and concentration camps. In such conditions, the outside, real environment is so barren and dehumanizing as to induce despair in most people. Those who survive are able to ignore selectively the external conditions and to redirect their attention to an inner life that is real only to themselves. It is easier to do so if you know poetry, mathematics, or some other system of symbols that allows you to concentrate and do mental work without any visible material props. These examples suggest what one needs to learn to control attention. In principle, any skill or discipline one can master on one's own will serve. Meditation and prayer, if one is so inclined. Exercise, aerobics, martial arts for those who prefer concentrating on physical skills. Any specialization or expertise that one finds enjoyable and where one can improve one's knowledge over time. The important thing, however, is the attitude toward these disciplines. If one prays in order to be holy, or exercises to develop strong pectoral muscles, or learns to be knowledgeable, then a great deal of the benefit is lost. The important thing is to enjoy the activity for its own sake, and to know that what matters is not the result, but the control one is acquiring over one's attention. Normally, attention is directed by genetic instructions, social conventions, and habits we learned as children. Therefore, it is not we who decide what to become aware of, but what information will reach consciousness. As a result, our lives are not ours in any meaningful sense. Most of what we experience will have been programmed for us. We learn what is supposed to be worth seeing, what is not, what to remember and what to forget, what to feel when we see a bat, a flag, or a person who worships God by different rites. We learn what is supposed to be worth living and dying for. Through the years, our experience will follow the script written by biology and culture. The only way to take over the ownership of life is by learning to direct psychic energy in line with our own intentions.